But it's so rare in Kitchener, like there's not many. It takes way too long, it can cost five, ten, thousand dollars or more. No resilient channel, no rock saw insulation, no fire drywall. My name is Matt Piche, aka The Fruitful Investor. I grew up in a middle class family. All I've ever wanted was freedom. By the age of 30, I became a self-made multi-millionaire, all from real estate investing. Follow me on my journey to travel the world when I want, where I want, while continuing to build a killer real estate business. Let's get it. What's up, Fruitful Investors? I'm here at Onria, and I made several hundreds of thousands of dollars in duplex conversions. I'm gonna be teaching the room how to do it. It's a packed house. Let's check it out. First off, big thanks to Sean and Jen for bringing me out here. I love speaking here in London at this event. There's a lot of really serious investors here, so I love networking, checking, or checking in with you guys. So I'll be sh sharing about duplex conversions. So we have a really great system right now on how to duplex uh, properties within 60, like 70 days. So I'm gonna share that system because there's a lot to know. There's a lot to cover today. So I'm gonna go a little quick to try and jam it in about a half an hour. So feel free to ask any questions if you have any throughout. It's cool, this is all about uh, helping you guys. So I don't mind stopping and answering any questions along the way. So who here has done a duplex conversion? So I get to know kind of the experience level. One, two, three, four, pretty good. So not too many. how did you guys find the process? Or finding from Gumi? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible, yes. Same thing, hard. <laughs> that's the common thing is that it's very uh, time consuming. It takes a lot of knowledge. You really have to know a lot about the building code, a lot about bylaws in your specific city. There's a lot to know about duplex conversions. So when I first started off, this is what I look like. So coming from a background, I have a background in carpentry. I am a carpenter. I had my own business renovating properties and I still, the first time I did one, I literally failed like every inspection that you can ever fail, like and multiple times. I just didn't know what the people wanted, what the inspectors wanted, what the bylaws were. So I had to kind of learn on the go. So I'm gonna teach you, you know, not to make the same mistakes I did. So why do duplex conversions in the first place? They're a really great opportunity for burrs. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because Kellen's whole presentation was that, so I'll leave that to him on how that works. But the reason why they're so good for that is because we're changing the use of the property so we can jack up the value a ton. So that's a really good thing to note because where I'm from in Kitchener, Waterloo, the market is really hot, just like I'm sure it is here in London, Woodstock. So we're not really able to get you know, smoking undervalued deals on MLS, not right now anyway. So the, the way we can jack up properties really high is by changing the use of the property. So single family to duplex. And because of this, we can actually compete with the first time home buyers. So they're going crazy right now, right? They're spending 40,000 over ask, 50,000 over ask because they're just desperate to buy a home for themselves. So it's hard for us to get good deals. However, with these, we can actually compete with them because we know we can jack the value up, you know, 100 grand, 80 grand. So we can pay the prices they're paying because they don't know what we know. They're just buying a home to live in. We know we can duplex it and really jack that value up. Also, they're more cash flow than a single family. So if you know me or follow me, you guys know I love single family because it's easy, it's boring, it attracts the highest quality in long-term real estate. Duplexes are not really that much different. They're kind of the same tenant profile, which I like. They're mostly families and you still get a little more cash flow because we have two units uh, rather than just one, we're getting more cash flow. So that's sweet. So we get the single family benefits also with the multifamily cash flow benefits. So we're kind of merging the two a bit. And they're still easy to sell when it comes time. So my favorite for single family, why I love it so much is because it's easy to exit. We can sell it to another family, we can sell it to an investor, we can sell it to pretty much whoever's looking for deals. For a duplex, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, first time buyers still love those, especially millennials, because they're trying to house hack, they're trying to reduce their expenses. So we can still sell it to them. We can sell it to a regular buyer. We can sell it to an investor. So it's easy to move these properties. So th these are some reasons why I love them. So why listen to me in the first place before I get into the presentation? As Jen said, I bought my first property at 22 years old. I now have 28 rental properties. About half of them are getting close to half are duplex conversions. Uh, my whole portfolio right now is worth $8 million. 
I've also raised well over $10 million in funds. That's kind of my other specialty is online marketing and JV attraction. And I'm also a realtor specializing solely with real estate investors in Kitchener-Waterloo. So a little plug, if you're buying properties in Kitchener-Waterloo as investment properties, you gotta use me. I'm literally like the only realtor that fully specializes with investors in Kitchener-Waterloo. So I'm gonna go over the five main critical things to know before buying your duplexes because I ran to so many people that came up to me after they bought them and said, Matt, I didn't check this out. I can't actually duplex it. I can't do this, I can't do that, and it's too late. They already bought the property, which is the worst thing to get into, right? So I wanna teach you guys what to know before you actually buy them. So number one, does the zoning already allow for it? This is a very, very simple phone call. If you're interested in buying 123 Main Street, call the planning department or the zoning office and just ask them, I'm trying to buy 123 Main Street, what's the zoning on this property? They'll tell you, R1, R2, R3, R4, whatever your city bylaw is, that's good. Now you know you can actually duplex it if it's an R3 or R4, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, the good thing is there's also an, an abundant amount of, oh, going back, the reason why you wanna do that is to avoid, if it's not uh, zoned for it, you wanna avoid doing a minor variance or even worse, a whole package to the city to try and change the zoning. It takes way too long, it can cost five, ten thousand dollars or more so just avoid all that already there's an abundant amount of properties that already allow it and have the zoning already so just focus on those and that's in my area anyway Kitchener Waterloo there's so many of them I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of single-family homes already have that zoning allowance for a duplex in Kitchener Waterloo anyway I don't know what it's like in London but uh, very easy to find them it's also super easy to get a permit if it already allows for the, uh, for the zoning. It's just simply filing the plans, which I'll talk about in detail, and then you, you get the permit stamped within 10 days, super fast. The biggest thing to know for is if the zoning allows for, let's say it's R3, R4, that's not enough. You can't just go buy the property based on that, on that alone. That just means the zoning allows for it. The next thing is the lot size. So in Kitchener-Waterloo and R4, for example, the lot frontage has to be a minimum of 30 feet which is super easy to find. So almost all properties are gonna meet that requirement, but take a look at that anyway. Uh, and the second thing is driveway length. So in Kitchener, the driveway must at least be 18 feet long. If it's 18 feet, you're good to go. Um, if your driveway is only like 10 feet, but there's, but there's a garage in front of it, that counts as parking. So again, super easy to find mostly, but take a look at that. These are the main things to focus on. Next thing up, how to file a permit once the zoning uh, allows for it, once you've bought the property. It's super easy, just show the upstairs layout. All the city wants to see is just where the kitchen is, where the bedroom is. You don't have to go insane with um, like all the measurements. I still do, I still provide all the measurements for all the bedrooms, all the doors, all the windows, but you don't have to go that insane on the upstairs. What they really wanna see is the proposed basement layout. So that's where you go in detail. How big are the windows going to be? How big are they now? Where are the doors? Where are the fire separation? Show everything. That's what the city wants to see before they issue the permit. So you can either hire a, uh, a drawer or architect to draw the plans, or you can do it yourself if you learn how to do it. It's pretty easy, but uh, you can just hire it out as well. It's about 1,800 to 2,000 bucks to do that. So get that done before. And then, like I said, give window sizes. And what you wanna do is file this permit before you close. So a lot of people think that you have to file it after you close on it. You've already missed the boat. You're about one to two months too late. So for example, we just bought a duplex conversion with a partner last week. I already filed the permit like four days after we bought it and it closes mid-November. So we're way ahead so that if there are any issues, I can start getting to them right now. So if the city says, you know, I need more windows in there, it's too dark, I need more of this, I have time to readjust the plans, resubmit, wait it, you know, five more days. So get that done before, so that on closing day, you literally go to your lawyer, pick up the keys, drive down to City Hall, get your permit, and then you start renovation tomorrow. That's kind of the ideal situation you want to do. Yep. How do you file before you close? Because you're not on title, so exactly. you're in the city, so how do you, how do you want to do that? Good question. So you can definitely file permits beforehand. They just won't issue the permit until closing day. So what I do as a partner, my partners are always on title, right? So I'm never on title. So I can still file it in my name. I just need the partner to sign a schedule one, a basic little form saying, yeah, I'm the owner. I give Matt permission to file it for me. And then on closing day, I just go to the office and say, yeah, it's October 1st, whatever, the house closed. Here you go, permit's issued. So you can file before, but you won't get it until closing day. A good question, I forgot that, to add that in. 
So these are my plants. Like I said, they look pretty stupid. <laughs> Looks like I drew them with a crayon. <laughs> in Kitchener, this is allowed. A lot of people who follow me from the GTA, they're always like, Matt, this would never fly in Toronto. You're insane. It looks like a two-year-old drew this, but it's allowed, man. So I do it myself. It literally takes me like 45 minutes to draw the plans. I save 2,000 bucks with my partners, super easy. So I don't know if that's the case for London. I'm assuming it probably is. It's a smaller city, it's not Toronto. You might be able to get away with this kind of stuff. So number two thing you, you wanna know is know your comps before you buy the duplexes. So before you actually do this, do you have comparables in your area that are gonna hit that R that you're looking for to get that bird to work? So for example, the average deal we're buying Kitchen Waterloo is 450,000, just like a, a bungalow. It's probably super outdated. We're gonna spend 90,000 renovating it. That's what it costs us pretty much every time for this system. So we're in it for 540. I know that property is worth 600 immediately because there's so many comps in Kitchener. So I had an investor come down from Sarnia to do a coaching session with me about last month. Um, and he wants to do my model in Sarnia. So he came down, was looking how to do duplex conversions. And the first thing I asked him kind of halfway through the day was, do you have comps in Sarnia for duplexes? And he kind of found out, not really. There's not really many finished duplexes that have sold. He asked his appraisers, you know, if I were to do this duplex conversion, what would it appraise for? And it was like nominal, it was like 50 grand or less, more than just a fixed up single family. So it didn't really work in that market. In Kitchener and probably London, et cetera, we have probably a ton of sold comparables to choose from. So we know they're gonna be worth 600. You know, they're like five sold last month in this area. So it's very strong. So just make sure that, because you don't wanna get screwed on this because the whole point of doing these conversions is to change the use, jack the value, pull your money out. And if you don't have comps to support it, you know, you're gonna be losing a lot of money or just in, in for, into the deal for a lot of money. Third thing you wanna look for is separate entrances and you wanna buy properties that already have a separate entrance. Don't get into the business of creating separate entrances, digging the basement down. I mean, you can if it's a smoking deal you got, but nine times out of 10, just focus on properties that already have the separate entrance, the side door, the back door. It just makes things super easy. It keeps costs way down. And if you find a bungalow that already has a side entrance with the stairs that go right down to the basement, that house was probably kind of already built for a duplex to have you know, an easy access to the basement. It kind of makes sense. The layout won't be awkward. That house was built to kind of be a duplex conversion. So just stick to those properties. It's way easier. You don't want to get to cutting doors and that's gonna take a month long. You need uh, big beams and stuff like that. Just avoid all of that. Again, there's a ton of these properties in Kitchener and Waterloo that already have the separate entrance. So we're just gonna focus on those. Fourth critical thing is egress windows. So I usually put in these two sliders uh, windows. So the one thing you need to watch out for is when you open that window, is it minimum 15 inches wide to crawl out? That's the minimum bylaw anyway in Kitchener, but most likely also Ontario building code. So that's without even popping the window out. So just a quick open in the case of a fire, is it a minimum 15 inches? I'll talk about my window sizes and how we overbeat that. One thing I learned actually recently, I've been doing these duplex conversions for like a couple of years now, just a couple months ago, I finally found out you only actually need one egress window in the apartment other than the front door. So it could be in the living room, could be in the bedroom, could be in the bathroom, whatever. As long as you have one egress window and that egress window must have a projection of three feet. That means that steel window well that's in the basement has to be three feet wide, like this wide, so they can crawl out easily. One of those windows has to have that. So what I was doing before was every single bedroom had an egress window. That's what I thought. But anyway, I still do crazy big windows, which I'll talk about now. So the average window size that I do in my bedrooms are 36 by 36. So it's a huge window. Let's in a lot of light. Why do we do that? Basements are usually dark, dingy. They feel like a cave. We want these places to feel nice and open. So I'm going super big on the windows. And again, that three foot by three foot window is gonna smash all the codes minimums for that egress window. And then in the main living room space, the kitchen living room, I do a 48 by 48 window. That's what I'm doing now. So the window is like massive. It lets in so much light. The window comes down to about here. You can just like crawl out of it. So it's super easy. It lets in a lot of that light in. So it doesn't feel so much like a basement. So one thing to note is that your regular windows uh, need to be a minimum of 2.5% of the square feet of the room. That's the other building code they're looking for. So if your bedroom's 100 square feet, the minimum size that window can be is 2.5 square feet of glass. Again, if you're doing the three foot by three foot, that's nine square feet of glass. So we're way over on almost any bedroom size um, for that, which is good, but that's the minimum. So really your window only has to be like this big in bedrooms 
well, to crawl out of anyway, so it's not really that big. Always go bigger, let more light in, make it feel like a better home. You'll get higher rent and a better quality tenant. Nobody wants to live in like a dark, dungy basement, right? Fifth critical thing you want to know is knowing the codes and the bylaws. So the Ontario Building Code. So this is where a lot of people, and when I first started out, I had no idea about this, it took forever to learn it. People don't know this, they get overwhelmed with all the fire separation. So essentially, what you want to do, number one, is in the joists and the ceiling, you want to put fire separating or fire resistant uh, insulation, so rock saw insulation, soundproofing. Then we do one layer of resilient channel. It looks like a little piece of metal that runs all across the joist. And then you put your 5 8 fire drywall on top of that. So that cuts the vibration. So what this does is that it kind of floats the ceiling from the joist so that when people are walking upstairs and banging, you don't hear pretty much anything. Mike? Half an inch. Well, it's not too bad. Yeah, it's just a half an inch piece of metal. Pardon? No, including the drywall, you're up one inch, one eighth in total. Yeah. So in Kitchener, they allow the resilient channels directly into So one thing I'm going to get ahead. So in Kitchener, they actually just wiped that completely on January 1st. That all you need now in Kitchener anyway, and Ontario Building Code actually, is half inch drywall. That's it. No resilient channel, no rock saw insulation, no fire drywall, just your regular basement drywall. Really? Yeah, so that's Ontario code. However, in Cambridge, they want all of this. So the bylaws might be different than the, the building code, which is, doesn't make any sense, but that's what it is. Which stock is double, double, I know, that's what I used to do. That used to, be, that used to be code two years ago, all across Ontario, no matter what, was double five eighths. Now it's just one, so now it's just half inch drywall, but I still do the, Sound separation and resilient and one layer of 5 8 And when you're done that, it, it honestly sounds like a recording studio. Like it's so quiet compared to the upstairs and that's what you really want. So the last thing you want is tenants complaining. I can hear my neighbor upstairs, you know, running around, their dogs running around. So avoid all of that. Just go over and above. It doesn't cost that much. The material's not that much. It takes your contractors two seconds to do it. Expanding on that, on knowing the codes, you don't have to do a sprinkler system in the furnace room as well. A lot of people think you need to do, you need to do that. That's very, very costly. All you have to do is just separate the fire separation between the units. So I get my guys to drywall around everything in the furnace room, which is a real pain in the ass because you got all the pipes going upstairs for the HVAC, all the plumbing. So they have fun doing that, but it's very, very cheap and still easy. It doesn't look like a pretty job because the mudding is almost impossible. So it just looks like shit. There's just mud everywhere, but it does the job. It separates the fire. That's all that matters. And it's way cheaper. Also, if you, if you want to do a sprinkler system, you need a one inch water line coming into your house, which the majority of houses in Kitchener are 1970s, it's three quarter. So if you want the sprinkler system, you got to update all of that right from the street, 5,000, 10,000 easy. So just spend the 300 bucks on drywall and just fire separate, right? Yep. Sorry, so you're just saying like in the actual, in your furnace room, in your mechanical room, yes. just drywalling the roof? Yeah, then... just get your contractors to drywall around everything as best as possible. It's going to look like crap, but it gets the job done. Yeah. And with just standard drywall? Just, no, the, the five eighths. Oh, with, with yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that one has to be five eighths. The rest of the living space can be half inch for code, but that's not enough. Yep. Is that five for all of Ontario? Just all of Ontario. Yeah, because when I just did in Cambridge, they need to be sprinkler. And they need to do all of this as well. They made you put a sprinkler? Yep. That's new to me. Megumi? Yeah, they, yeah. they want a sprinkler? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Guelph? Yeah. Well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But they're easy. <laughs> yeah. So know the bylaws, right? Just because Ontario Building Code says this, each city is going to have their own thing. Kitchener seems to be very lenient. They just want more housing. It's desperate for housing. They just waived all of that, which I think they went too far by getting rid of all the uh, uh, insulation and stuff, but that's what it is, right? And then fire cock everything. So in the furnace room, like I said, your guys aren't going to be able to drywall super tight to all the HVACs. So they're going to have a lot of gaps. They just use the fire caulking, just put it everywhere. So any penetration from the basement to the upstairs must be fire caulked. Any wires going through, any plumbing going through, they all gotta be wrapped with the fire caulking just to separate everything. Okay, yep. Fire tape on the drywall, yes, yes. You just have to have good inspectors. Some inspectors don't let it go, some, yeah. I'll talk about that too, but yeah, that's a good thing to do. So, before or once you buy the property, always book a pre-inspection before you actually start finishing the basement. Colton? Sorry, Matt. Do you yep. have to have, uh, I heard from duplex emergency, you have to hardwire the fire lines. Yes. Does that mean that you have to do that? Yep. So you have to do interconnected smoke detectors for both units and they have to be strobes as well. 
So that means that they talk to you, they blink for deaf people. It's pretty intense. Everywhere. And everywhere. And bedrooms. Everywhere. Bedrooms, living rooms, kitchens. It's crazy, yeah. It's insane. Yeah. So always book a pre-inspection before you actually start finishing it. So what I recommend is when you buy the property, gut the whole basement right away. It's probably what you're gonna do anyway to kind of rebuild it. Gut everything. So if you have asbestos wrapped HVAC, I'm not gonna tell you to get rid of it, but you should probably get rid of it before they come. So gut the whole basement before they come. Then before you start working, they come, they'll tell you, I wanna see this, I wanna see that, I wanna see this window like this. So get their opinion before you actually start working because the way it works in Kitchener anyway, every neighborhood has their own assigned home inspector. That's all they do is that area. Some are very easy to work with, some are not very easy to work with. For example, I don't know who, who's here from Kitchener, right? So Fairview Mall has the worst inspector. So just, just be ready for that. <laughs> Everywhere else, super easy. <laughs> so they'll tell you what they wanna see and then, then you can start proceeding with the work and then you, you won't get you know, failing on inspections every time. So what do I look for in my duplexes? What I'm really after is three bedrooms up and two bedrooms down. That's the gold standard in Kitchener. It's pretty easy to find a house with three beds up, but I wanna be able to fit two beds down. So I need a big duplex, probably a thousand square feet or more. And I, I really wanna jam two bedrooms in there. That gives me the rent of 1,700 up, 1,500 down, plus hydro on both. I pay gas and water, and you get that higher ARV for the appraisal, you get more rent, it cash flows more. I still have the one bedroom basements and I still will do them, but they're not as sexy as the two bedrooms. That's really where you jack the value. Mike? You said plus hydro on the Yeah, so we split hydro. Yeah, so we split hydro and everything, that's a must. Again, Splitting, doing all the wiring for my projects take about 14 to 16,000 bucks in wiring. So that's everything wired, pot lights, separate meters. And that alone, your separate meters is gonna add at least 20, 30,000 to the value of the property alone. So you're like doubling what you're spending. So always, always uh, separate the hydrometers. Again, with rising hydro rates in Ontario, I don't, I don't have to tell you that. Pass that on to the tenant, make them pay for that. Yeah, about, so if you already have the wiring to split the meters, you're probably like 8,000. When I do everything, it's about 16 grand. That's again, I'm doing pot lights, I'm doing fire detectors, everything like that. Yeah, so that's the, but it's worth it, it's worth it. Yep. When you have a house, just how do you split it up? Like what's, uh, when you're looking at it, like split mm -hmm. it up? Upstairs is one unit, and downstairs is another? Yeah, so most time upstairs is one, basement one. The best kind are side by side. That's the best kind, but they're super hard to find, in my area anyway. So we're converting a, a duplex, or sorry, uh, a bungalow. So the main floor basement, yep. So side by side also has a basement? It could, it could, yeah. If you have like two semi-detached properties and you own both of them, that's the best kind to own, but very rare, yeah. So yeah, three up, two down. Uh, what I look for again is double wide driveway. Can I make it double wide? Is there enough room to do that? That's a my side. I want two cars in tandem, two sets. So I need four cars to fit on the driveway. That's really what I'm looking for. That's what you want as well because if I'm putting two bedrooms in, what kind of tent do you think I'm gonna get? It's probably a family with one kid, two kids. So they need cars. Mom and dad are gonna have a car, right? Yep. Yeah, so I avoid that if I can. Um, normally the entrance is like a good size and then we just swoop in. Yeah. yeah, we'll double wide the driveway, we'll keep the entrance single if we can. If we can. Most, most times we can get away with it. Yeah, avoid the curb cutting. Then you're getting the city involved and we know how that works. We don't wanna do that. Um, and I look for mostly cosmetic mainly. So I'm looking mostly for 1970s ugly homes that haven't been updated forever. I stay away from almost all my projects, flips, single family, everything. I stay away from adding beams, foundation cracks, you know, crappy roofs that need to be totally rebuilt, which is funny because I'm a carpenter, that's where I came from. I don't wanna do that for me. I like to look for cosmetic, easy, paint, floor, trim, kitchens, baseboards, out, right? That's what I'm looking for. So those are the kind of properties I want. So I'm gonna do movie time. So I'm gonna show you actually our recent duplex conversion we just finished. It'll kind of make a little more sense instead of me standing up here. What's up, Fruitful Investors? We're standing in front of our newest duplex conversion. It is finally done. It looks incredible. I can't wait to show you the inside. Let's check it out. All right, so this was a single family property before. It was completely outdated, like right from the 70s. 
So we pretty much gutted everything. New floors, new baseboard, did the accent wall. Nice paint job throughout, looks pretty good, eh? Yeah, I've seen this property a couple times as like the renovations are going on. I'm really excited to see it now that it's totally done. Yeah. It looks so nice. Um, I really like the high ceiling. Yeah, this is a cool cathedral ceiling. Yes. So this was a 60 day project right from the beginning. So a really quick turnaround for a duplex conversion. But let's check out the rest of the house here. noticed during our first walkthrough that it smelled really strong of cigarettes. Yeah. It's really musty and you don't smell that at all. Yeah, exactly. It's like, just feels very new and yeah, fresh. Yeah, nice and clean. So we got three bedrooms up on this main floor and then we just did the dining room here. This was where the basement door was to go downstairs when it was a single family home. So we blocked that off, fire rated Never it. Never know. Never know. Redid the kitchen because we had to put in the washer and dryer stackable for the main unit in here. So we kind of squished it all in, but I think it worked out pretty good. It's a nice tight little kitchen, but lots of cabinet space. Yeah, a ton of cabinet space. And I think again, we were able to use the existing appliances yeah, that were again. here. I think the only thing maybe we added was the dishwasher. Yeah, right. I don't think this place had a dishwasher. Yeah. Um, We've been getting lucky lately. But I think it turned out really nice. The, the molding. Yeah, I love the crown molding on yeah. the cabinets. Nice big double sink, restaurant tap. Yeah, the sink is actually huge. Yeah. For like a main level like rental unit this is really nice yeah and like it looks it's a small footprint of a kitchen yeah but there is like a ton of counter space in here yeah so. our kitchen layout designer did a really good yeah, job she did an awesome job i can really see a tenant loving that piece. for sure All right, so this is the basement unit. This was where the majority of the work was. Do you remember how it looked before? Yeah. You've only been here a couple times, so. Well, there was a bar. Yeah, a weird 70s here, bar. And then there was another room, and that was it. Yeah. And then like a really big utility room. So like this space has yeah. been so transformed. It's actually a huge space, yeah. right? Like the kitchen is nice that it's like against this wall. It's a good layout. It's a really good layout. Like. And again, we did the great put, wall of tile. I mean, you could right potentially put shelves here so I think yeah. it actually make it more usable but it's really great they can even put like a tiny little like yeah, table kitchen or... here or not kitchen but table yeah and then still have all of this space yeah for whatever right like my favorite thing in this whole apartment is this giant four foot by four foot window this is what we're doing now in all of our duplexes massive. which is way above code like code would only require us to do a window like this big screw that we did this huge window it just lets in so much natural light this is what we're doing now in all the duplexes, no matter what. All right, so you guys get it. Any questions on the video or anything on the building before I get on? Yep. Do you cut any of the windows? Do I get any windows? Uh, no, do you, do you cut the windows into the foundation or do you look for them over? Yeah, so we cut it into the foundation every time. Oh. Yeah, we added a three foot strip of concrete. So we added, I didn't show it. Well, I did, it's in the rest of it, but I don't want to keep bored you guys, make you watch it all. Now I can't figure out how to play this again. Sure. John? <laughs> Current slide. What was that? Sorry. Uh, is it always concrete? Or no. It's actually the last time I did concrete. So I did concrete on this one, and uh, the neighbors called the bylaw again. Damn neighbors! They called, <laughs> and the bylaw officer came and was like, "Technically, if you do uh, concrete, it has to be the same material. You can't park on it." We're gonna see how that goes. <laughs> I would always do asphalt, but at this time of the year, asphalt guys are busy or just ignore you. So I had to do the concrete, uh, but ideally you would just replace all of it with the same material, apparently, then you're good. It'll be fine. <laughs> so here's the numbers on that deal that I just showed you. So we've just finished it. Uh, appraisals 
like next week, but I know it's gonna work because we've done it so many times. Uh, so we purchased that property specifically at 395, down payment 75, 79 grand, renovation 90 grand as always, closing costs 1700, land transfer tax 3200, total investment for my partner 173 grand, that's what they have to dealt out for me. Total project into the total project if you add all of, all of it up, 489, I know the ARV is 600,000, we've done a ton of these, 60 day project in 60 days we made 110 grand in equity, okay not bad. So this is a perfect bird. Kellen's gonna talk about this, how exactly this works. But real quick on the monthly breakdown after the refinance at the top value, mortgage payment 2000, property taxes, property manager uh, 160, my property manager charges 5% because I give them, give them so much business. Anybody who works with me in Kitchener, you also get 5% rent if you go with my property manager, so super good deal. Uh, utilities 250, so again, we're splitting the hydro meters, tenants pay that, we're paying water and gas. It's too hard to split those on a, on a refab house. So total expenses for the month, 2,793 bucks. Monthly rent, I told you 1,700 up, 1,500 down. Total cash flow after the refi, 406 bucks. And my partner uh, after the refi is gonna be into the deal for 60, 75 grand around there, about 60 grand. So that in Kitchener is a home run. I know Kellen's probably gonna talk about some crazy deals where he gets all the money back. Not gonna happen in Kitchener, Waterloo, <laughs> but this was a slam dunk for Kitchener. Any questions on, on the numbers? Yep. Yeah. 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 Could definitely. I haven't done one. I know Kellen's done a bunch of those, so he'll probably talk about that. I just like my guys giving me cash, so all my partners get. It's mostly comes from their HELOC, so they're doing their uh, line of credit money. And then they're getting an, an open mortgage for three months. We're banging these out in two to three months max. And then, and then we'll get a regular you know, TD, RBC uh, mortgage on it, pull the money out, and then we're laughing for the next five years, right? So that's kind of how we're doing it. Yep. There's one on real estate agent. How do you really find out what the comps are in the neighborhood other than just going on realtors and yeah. people selling your house for? Yeah, so because I have access, I can look. I do this 24 seven, this is all I do. So I know the comps before I even, I just walk in, I'm like, yeah, I, I know. It's gonna cost this much and, and you know, a price for this. So we do it so much. So become an expert, specialize, have a realtor on your team that specializes in this. It'll help you out for sure. Anything else before we move on? Yep. Just super quickly. So could, would you say this is Kitchener specific or Waterloo and Kitchener are very comparable right now? Or? Yeah. So Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge are the same market, except for Waterloo. We ignore Waterloo completely because, <laughs> <laughs> because of the rental license. So in order to be a landlord in Waterloo, you have to have a license. Nobody buys there anymore. All my clients do Kitchener, Cambridge, which is the same market. Same numbers as this. Cambridge is a little cheaper, also a little more rough in certain areas, but same thing. Yep. Rental licensing, uh, because it's really bigger than like property. Yeah. So, so like, what is the issue of getting a rental Just expensive. So yeah. why invest there when I can just walk over the line and do it over here for, yeah. right? Yeah, anything else? Yeah, Colton? They pay everything. My, my uh, partners pay everything. Renovation, closing costs, down payment. Well, the 173. The 173, yeah, if they're getting a mortgage on it. So my partner's gotta pay for everything. I take care of all the work. I do all this, I bring my crew in. I've proven it. We do it over and over again. Super easy. Yeah, so they're buying the house for 395. Yes. So they write a check for 395. Or they get a mortgage for the rest. They just put down the 20% down. So they have to yeah. put up 173 grand. Yeah. And after the refi, they're only into the deal for about 60 when it's all said and done. Yeah, yeah, and Kellen will talk about that. Yep. You always put backsplash? Always, always. So it just elevates it up. And again, in the basement, you'll notice there was no upper cabinets in the basement. Ceilings are a little low. We try and go for the highest ceiling we can, but typically they're about here. So I don't put uppers because it just makes it make it feel really short. So I just tile all the way up. It just really makes it feel bigger, right? It's kind of like an illusion. Both. Both. Just style, aesthetics. It's all about the aesthetics, man. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Uh, what's a rough breakdown of the renovation? Yeah. I think you could squeeze, you don't have to do the crazy windows like I do. You could squeeze on that, I'll make it a little smaller. Uh, on the wiring, I, I tend to go pretty crazy because I do pot lights throughout both levels, especially if it's a bungalow and there's no second floor. Why not? I get my guy go in the attic, punch all the holes in. So I kind of go, I. My theme of renovation is always go a little insane, but it really pays off, right? So 
get better quality tenants, better appraisals, especially if we're doing the Burr strategy, we really wanna go insane because you wanna wow the appraiser. And one tip I give is go tell your appraiser you want like 25 grand more than you want. For example, for this one, I want 600. So I'm gonna tell the appraiser I want 625. So when he goes through, he's gonna be like, yeah, that's 625 my ass. He'll give me 600, I laugh, I won. He thinks he won. Okay. That's what we just did on a big multifamily. Uh, I wanted 1.35 million on this on four townhomes. I told the appraiser 1.4 million. He gave me 1.375. He thought I won. I totally won. Right? Yep. Yeah, so now the market's really changed. So this was like two months ago. Okay. Now it's 450 to get the same home, but the comps are 625, 650. Same thing, just a little more. It'll, and who knows, December, January, February rolls around, might go drop down to 400 again. We'll see, right? Yep. Oh yeah, exactly, yeah, he knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this house was listed for 380, I think it was. We overbid, right? because we can, we can compete with the home buyers, we beat them all out. We look stupid, but two months later, not really, right? Because we know we can do this. You're buying everything that's listed. Yeah, almost every deal we do is listed on, on MLS, yeah. It's crazy, yeah. I only flip off-market deals, so that's the thing, that's the difference. If you're flipping real estate, you're not gonna get a deal off MLS, impossible. You have to flip off-market. If we're doing buy and holds, there's a ton of MLS deals, ton of them. Yeah, you give me? I just want to point out, some cities only allow like, a certain percentage to be utilized. Yes, place. that's a good point. I should mention yeah, that. So Cambridge. Yeah. 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 So Cambridge, it's a crazy dumb rule that the basement can only be 40% square foot of the upstairs. But if you have a, a, a bungalow, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. So you have to make your furnace room huge. It's so stupid, because the furnace room doesn't count as room, so you're making these furnace rooms gigantic, and then you can't put a second bedroom in. What I would suggest is after done, and the inspector passes it, shorten out that furnace room, put a second bedroom, <laughs> call it a day, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the same, it's the same here in London for a secondary dwelling. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're holding them, it's capital gain. So you only pay tax on half of it, if you flip them, you're paying income on, or tax on all of it, right? right yeah. yeah. So it's up to you. I mean, yeah. How would your typical joint venture work? So the investor did for 60,000, how much of the 406 do they keep and how much of the appreciation in the property once it's sold? Like if they partner with me? So it's 50-50 split on profits. So they put all the money in, they buy it the same uh, as if they're buying their own. Same thing, they gotta put all the money in, except the difference is on closing day, I take over. So I manage the whole thing, I bring my crew in, do my system. Uh, and then I manage the property managers for the whole time we own it, bookkeepers, accountants, I do everything. And then my partners relax, chill. And then five years later when we sell it, I'll pay them back whatever is like money in that they have first, then whatever's left over is 50-50. But I, I do everything. Who keeps the 406? Uh, the 406, what do you mean? Oh, the cash flow. Yeah, so technically we split that. However, we're not gonna party on 200 bucks each a month. So <laughs> we just t pool all of it in the property's bank account, let it build up, let it build up, but technically it's 50-50, but we're not pulling from it until later. If we have a big multifamily property that cash flows 2,000 bucks a month, then we might draw 500 bucks each. This is not worth it. Could be. So most of my partners buy it in their personal name. I'm doing all of my JVs in a corp. Might as well, because I'm off title. Why do I put it in my personal name? I'll put it in a corp. I have better liability, but more important, tax rates, like, 10 times lower. Not 10 times, but five times, right? Yeah? How did you splitting the um, income tax that your partners pay for both entities? Yeah, so every year we file 50% on everything. So my accountant, I take care of my accountant, he does all the uh, numbers, and he sends me the statement, here's your statement, Matt, here's your statement, John, we file 50-50 on all the profits of the year, et cetera. So we're filing every year together. Yeah. Any questions? I think we're almost at question time anyway. So recap real quick. Um, well, it's the wrong slide. All right, thank you for that. <laughs> so if you saw the video, that was a quick little plug for you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Fruitful Investor. I put out two videos a week with my man Ali here. This is my social media guy. That's why we're filming this. I've put a lot of content out on there. 
Follow me on Instagram for sure for my day in the life. I post like 10 times a day. You guys see exactly what I'm doing all day. Just follow along, steal everything I'm doing. I don't care. No. Any other questions before I head out? Cool. All right, thank you.